Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Ace Spotlight presentation. My name is Ruz Bafra Siabi, and I'll be your host. Uh, today, we have Wen Hao Gao, uh, who is an incoming PhD student at MIT, uh, Department of Chemino Chemical Engineering. And uh, he will be talking about uh, his uh, recent work uh, titled The Synthesizability of Molecules Proposed by Generative Models. Uh, with that, and without further ado, I hand things over to Wen Hao. Wen Hao, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the best introduction. Um, I'm Wen Hao Gao, and thanks for having me here. I really appreciate this chance for uh, to share our work about uh, synthetic visibility, uh, for short, uh, synthesizability in our paper um, in the novel molecular generation and optimization. So first, uh, let's uh, talk about the problem we want to solve. It's uh, molecular design, uh, one of the most fundamental tasks in uh, chemical science and engineering. So if you remember, uh, materials are composed of molecules. Uh, of course, uh, by broad definition, it's uh, atoms interacting with each other. Uh, and uh, as one of the most basic uh, hypotheses in chemical science, uh, properties are fully determined by structure. So having the uh, correct chemical structure will lead us to materials with desired properties. And that process is called uh, molecular design. Uh, solutions, or at least part of the solution to many grand challenges uh, faced by human society requires uh, better material, uh, like health or energy or environment problem. And this molecule, uh, for example, Remdesivir, maybe the most famous small molecule right now due to this pandemic, uh, is used as a drug against uh, COVID-19. And this structure uh, has high affinity to uh, SARS-CoV-2's uh, RNA polymerase and inhibits its uh, function. And although uh, someone may know, uh, Remdesivir becomes famous during this pandemic, but it is originally designed for other diseases like uh, Ebola. And so we are indeed repurposing this existing uh, drugs uh, instead of redesigning a perfect icon for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, part of the reason, uh, of course, uh, there's uh, some time limit, time constraint for clinical trials, but at least part of the reason is the molecular design pr uh, process is too expensive, both in time and uh, money. Uh, most drugs uh, are not designed uh, through repurposing and uh, designing process takes about 10 years and uh, billions of dollars per drug. So why molecular design is so expensive? Um, our current baseline method is called high throughput virtual screening. And the virtual screening uh, starts from an initial library of molecules uh, that we evaluate the property uh, we want, such as uh, bioactivity or solubility, for every candidate. And uh, although we can uh, build the library based on some chemical intuition, which uh, narrows down the pool of uh, possible molecules, but uh, it's, it's too hard to know where the ideal molecules will be within this uh, massive chemical design space. Thus, um, the, thus people are uh, using exceedingly larger libraries uh, now. And the uh, whole drug-like small molecules often cited as exceeding 10 to 60 structure. The virtual screening is quite successful, of course. And one recent example is uh, Liu investigated 170 million structures to find the inhib inhibitors for uh, this lactamase and the uh, default dopamine receptor. And for each structure, they run a docking simulation to figure out that its affinity, affinity and uh, found about 50 uh, promising candidates at the end. And this work is published in Nature in 2019. And that's already uh, 170 millions. And uh, some modern uh, libraries, such as Enamin's uh, real uh, database, uh, has exceeded uh, 13 billion. However, even 13 billion is far away from, you know, 60 to 60. And the uh, chemical space of size of billions is already um, computationally intractable. So that's, uh, this is where we come to generative models. Uh, given a structure, uh, we can carry out experiment or uh, run a simulation 
to uh, evaluate the property for that. And that's a traditional QSAR task. But the design uh, problem requires an inverse mapping from the functional space to the chemical space. In virtual screening, uh, we are simply enumerating uh, the possible candidates uh, in this discrete chemical space and repeat the property prediction uh, for each and uh, run them uh, for the following app experimental validation. And we know that's an astronomic number. Uh, in recent years, uh, the progress in de novo uh, molecular generation uh, algorithms raise a hope for uh, removing this bottleneck, especially the deep uh, generative algorithms, most notably uh, VAE or GAN, uh, they can train on a finite set of molecules and learn a continuous representation of the chemical space. Uh, interpolation within this space, uh, interpolation within this uh, you know, continuous, uh, continuous chemical space uh, will lead us to novel structures that are beyond the limited uh, starting pool. And uh, under the same distribution of the training set, and that's what we call distribution learning. And because uh, we have a continuous space, so we can directly apply some optimization methods such as reinforced learning or vision optimization to optimize uh, one uh, property, of course, also with a, a property predictor. And that's what we call a uh, goal-directed generation. And uh, the main benefit is once the model is trained, it only takes linear computational cost to generate multiple structures. And uh, because we are doing uh, interpolation or extrapolation uh, in this continuous chemical space, so it would lead us to chemical structure that beyond the limited beginning proof and help us find novel structures with better IP position whereas the, in the virtual screening case, molecules are often pre-existing. And here's one recent example. Uh, the team from uh, in Silico Medicine combined GAN and reinforced learning uh, to identify DDR1 kinase inhibitor. <clears throat> and uh, by using this uh, generative method, they, it only took uh, 46 days, including the biological evaluation to obtain uh, this structure while a regular uh, late identification process takes about years. And uh, although we should recognize their work as uh, more like a heat expansion rather than a regular late generation, it still shows the great potential of uh, de novo generative methods in molecular design. Um, but there's, of course, there's one problem about uh, de novo generative methods, the synthesizability. Uh, the team of the, from the Institute Medicine selected only six molecules from uh, 40 based on synthetic accessibility. And that 40 is already uh, filtered from an initial set of uh, 30,000 uh, generated pool uh, with some kind of filters to remove the structures with uh, unreasonable uh, motifs. And that's not a single case. Uh, these are some molecules I generated using uh, MoDQN a uh, uh, reinforcement learning based gener generative model to optimize QED, which uh, quantify the drug likeliness. And uh, we can see this is okay, this is okay, but uh, the others, uh, you know, I don't even <laughs> sure uh, it can stay stable for a while, so not, not to mention even synthesize them. And of course, part of the reason is uh, the uh, property predictor we are using, uh, such as the QED, are mainly uh, machine learning models or some based on some heuristic uh, definition that uh, cannot be generalized to some edge cases. Uh, but it's un undeniable that uh, at least some of the generative algorithms um, have a high risk of giving unsynthesizable structures as their output. And that was not uh, such a big problem when we use virtual screening, uh, because most of the libraries are constructed from commercially available uh, building blocks, like in the Leo's case, um, they link them together using uh, well-characterized chemical reactions. 
And as evidence, Leo reported about 86% uh, of successful synthesis rate among the 51 top ranking molecules. But when we come to de novo generation, because we want to generate something novel beyond uh, initial training data set. So synthesizability becomes a major concern that other, otherwise, as we shown above, uh, the generation would be you know, too inefficient. And uh, so to take uh, synthesizability into account, the first challenge we are facing is how to quantify synthesizability. And uh, you know, by definition, it is the hardness of synthesizing one molecule. So to some extent, it's, um, it's an intuitive and subjective concept. Um, different chemists may feel different about the same molecule. And because the chemical reactions have uh, ritual selectivity, uh, so even changing the positions of the functional group from one carbon to another uh, will largely change the synthesis, the hardness of the synthesis. So the overall structure is still pretty similar. And we say it has a high nonlinearity with, re with, with respect to structure. And of course, uh, we start from the viable chemicals, so it's sensitive to the chemicals available. The chemical market is evolving, and so as the concept of synthesizability. And the former attempts are mainly focused on three approaches. The first one is cross-source uh, scoring. As you know, the synthesizability is an intuitive and subjective concept, so the most direct way is we simply let a group of experts to score the hardness uh, of they, they think synthesizing this uh, molecule. And one example is mean complex, complexity, uh, the experiments done in Merck. And uh, the second class is based on structure uh, complexity. For example, is uh, SA score. Uh, is, SA score used the uh, frequency of occurrence of um, the substructure as a measurement of synthesis accessibility. And for a molecule, we just add the score for each substructure together. And the third class is based on reaction pathway. And one example is SC score. And that is a, a deep learning model that trained to distinguish if a molecule is more likely to be reactant or product. And the reactants, because uh, it requires uh, less reaction steps, uh, we think is they are easier to synthesize. Um, which is uh, uh, one uh, chemical intuition. And uh, among these three, the most convincing metric is the direct scoring by a group of experimental experts because it fits the definition very well. And uh, uh, indeed, the uh, expert scoring are usually used as a ground truth to train other uh, machine learning models. But to have a group of um, uh, experts that is large enough to reach a non-biased value is labor intensive and hard to replicate and of course not scalable. So um, to overcome this uh, bottleneck, um, to have a better quantification of synthesability, uh, let's first look uh, see how uh, chemists figure out how to synthesize a molecule. And uh, the method they use is called uh, retrosynthetic analysis. Uh, first line, you can see this is a normal two-step reaction. Uh, two reactants uh, form a carbon-carbon bond and hydrolysis leads us to this product. And the retrosynthetic analysis is uh, its inverse process. Given this uh, target structure, we first examine which bond um, is the easiest to form without disturbing the uh, remaining parts. And uh, uh, according to the position of these functional groups. And we break that bond, found the reactant for uh, this reaction uh, according to the structure of the pieces, two pieces, and the reaction type that can lead us to the target uh, product, we think. And this, uh, this process forms one step of uh, ritual synthetic analysis. And if we have a more uh, complex target, we can iteratively apply this process until all the reactants are commercially available. Then uh, we will have a complete route to synthesize the uh, target compound. And that process is called ultrasynthetic analysis. And that process can be done by computation uh, computer. 
and we call it a uh, computer aided synthesis planning, uh, also CASP. And early CAST tools uh, relied uh, on expert craft reaction rules and uh, some heuristic to describe possible uh, retrosynthetic um, disconnection step, but uh, they suffered from its incompleteness and uh, infeasible, some infeasible suggestions and of course human bias. Uh, recently, uh, deep learning models largely improved the performance of the CASP and uh, in each step, uh, we fit a target compound to a neural network to classify uh, which kind of retrosynthetic transformation should be applied to uh, this current step, this current compound. And uh, for each uh, reaction uh, we get, we can use another neural network to check uh, if this uh, chemical reaction is feasible or not, and uh, filter out the unfeasible ones. And uh, then we come here, we uh, check uh, every reactant, if these reactants are viable or not. And we, if, if not, we go back to repeat this cycle. And if yes, we have a, a synthetic route to the target product. And our implementation of this is called ASCOS. And uh, within the ASCOS, the data-driven uh, models is trained on uh, millions of reactions from the U.S. Patent and uh, Trademark Office, USPTO, and the uh, Reaxis uh, databases. And the expansion is parallelized using an uh, upper confident bound tree search. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> if the performance of the ritual synthetic planner can reach a human expert level, then we can use it as a stable and a scalable source to benchmark the synthesizability. So in this work, we use ASCOS to do so. Uh, first, of course, as a, a deep learning based CAST tool, we expect it to capture the high nonlinearity of synthesizability. And indeed, in this uh, case we mentioned above, uh, the ASCOS can distinguish the difference of synthesizability uh, between the two structure that SA and SA score cannot distinguish. That it means uh, we can find a path for this, but we cannot find, for, find, a, path, find a path for this. And of course, it recommends an actionable uh, synthetic pathway. And thus we can uh, take, at, uh, take it as an uh, interpretability to verify why this molecule is believed to be synthesizable and with which uh, building blocks and uh, in how many steps. And of course, uh, it also saves the work for uh, experimental chemists for follow-up uh, experimental validation. And uh, ASCOS has a rather uh, flexible setting with study, starting chemical uh, proofs, and we can update it uh, whenever we need. And of course, it's open sourced. Uh, I have a GitHub link here, so it can be uh, unlimited uh, accessed. So. <clears throat> By well, now, if, yes. if I can interrupt you for a second, uh, sure. about ASCOS, uh, is it possible to, to use ASCOS for, um, for multi-step uh, synthesis? Uh, yes, of course. So it's not limited to, to predicting one-step reactions? Uh, yes, uh, it has an interface for predicting one-step reaction, and the, the name for one-step reaction is called uh, retrosynthetic analysis, so it's a little bit confusing. But uh, there's another uh, function called uh, tree expansion or tree search. I'm, I'm not uh, clearly remember that, but uh, that is a function for uh, multi-step retrosynthetic analysis. Okay, thank you. And uh, that multi-step uh, retrosynthetic analysis is what I uh, used in this uh, work. And uh, uh, okay, by using ASCOS, um, the next problem, of course, we need to figure out is uh, if the result of ASCOS is really uh, valuable and makes sense from the uh, perspective of uh, synthesizability. And we found it is. Uh, we evaluated a, a thousand and uh, 730 molecules scored by pharmaceutical uh, chemists from Merck and found the result of ASCOS is compatible with expert scoring. Uh, in this plot, the x-axis is the number of reactions uh, steps needed to synthesize the target. Zero means uh, commercially available, and this means, of course, um, non we cannot find a path for that. And y-axis mean complexity is the expert score. 
And the first, in general, uh, unsynthesizable ones have a higher mean value compared to the synthesizable ones. And further, uh, there's a trend that the ones uh, need more steps have a, to synthesize have a higher export score compared to the ones need fewer steps. And that is also compatible with our one uh, chemical intuition that, of course, uh, we mentioned um, the molecules that require fewer steps are easier to synthesize. Of course, it's not always true, but it's uh, one chemical intuition. And another thing we should notice is uh, the viable ones have a slightly higher value and a larger range. Um, I think that can be explained by we can buy some uh, pretty complex uh, chemicals directly, and uh, such as uh, some natural products. And uh, uh, then for further validation, uh, we investigate several common databases to see if the results are reasonable or not. And this plot shows the fraction for each uh, predict number of uh, synthetic steps uh, required to uh, produce a random sample of uh, 3,000 molecules from each database. Uh, the most synthesizable ones is the MOSES, uh, almost 90% synthesizable, uh, which is a filtered version of zinc so it uh, focuses on small molecules like zinc and removed plants uh, with unfavorable motifs. And uh, its parents said zinc is uh, about 60% synthesizable and because it's a virtual library, uh, so uh, some of them are unsynthesizable and unsynthesized before. So, um, but it's uh, focused uh, on drug-like small molecules, so basically it's still okay. 60% about, and uh, Campbell is indeed a bioactivity uh, database, and uh, thus it contains uh, biologically relevant chemicals that has been tested before. So either they has been uh, they have been uh, synthesized or they simply exist in nature. So although it contains more uh, complex uh, structures compared to zinc, it's uh, more synthesizable. Uh, Sheridan's uh, is the data we just mentioned uh, that doesn't make too much sense. And uh, GDB is a fully enumerated uh, library. And thus the molecules uh, within this database uh, should be evenly distributed across the whole valid chemical space. And so it contains a lot of structure that is uh, valid but weird. And as expected, uh, it has uh, only uh, about 3% synthesizable. Um, That's, sorry, Wenhao. Yeah. Um, so uh, in regards to, to uh, ASCOS, because uh, we didn't talk about it a lot, how is ASCOS um, the trained? Uh, wh what type of database uh, do you use? Is there any um, um, any any um, relation between, between the data used for, for training ASCOS and uh, the data sets that you're using for validation? Uh, the data set we use to train these networks uh, is uh, these two networks is the uh, reaction data from uh, USPTO, which is mm -hmm. the uh, US Patent and uh, Trademark Office, and the database of REAXIS. Uh, so is there any overlap between, between that data set and the data sets that you're using for validation, or there's no overlap? Have you uh, have you tested that, or do you do you have any information about that? Uh, sorry, I don't have information about that. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, it's, that's a, fine. it's a good question. I think um, we may need to examine that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So um, with this current result, and uh, combined its uh, consistency with the expert score. I think we can say to some extent, at least, the result of ASCOS is uh, compatible with our intuition about the synthesizability. And so uh, we can use it to better uh, further evaluate the, the generative methods. So the first question we want to answer <clears throat> is uh, how frequent uh, do current generative algorithms propose on, synthes on synthesizable structures? And as mentioned earlier, we divide generating, uh, generation, uh, generative methods into two types. Uh, first is the distribution learning, and uh, that gives us unoptimized molecules 
uh, that uh, simply maximize the probability of its belonging to its uh, training set and optimize molecules uh, generated from goal direct generation that uh, try to optimize in one property. And we adapt the implementation of these algorithms uh, from two benchmarking papers uh, called MOSES and Guacamole and uh, evaluate the structure uh, generated by them. And the uh, conclusion is, um, it is okay when we just want some regular molecule. Uh, the random here represents the fraction of synthesizable chemicals in Campbell database as a baseline. Uh, it's also the training set, and we can see the distribution learning methods all have uh, about 60% uh, synthesizable fraction, uh, which is kind of acceptable. But uh, it struggles uh, when we want some molecules with op optimized properties. Uh, uh, which is the uh, most useful for case and the same case of uh, DDR1 kinase inhibitor and the MoDQN1. Uh, here is the, the first the best of the data is the virtual screening from uh, Campbell as a baseline and the color represents the synthesizability fraction of the synthesizable fraction of the top 100 suggestions. And we run experiment for uh, these 10 different objective functions uh, in Guacamole to simulate the process of uh, drug discovery. One example is Zebron, and uh, this is the name for a drug, and that uh, property means uh, we want to find molecules that have some property of a Zebron, but the structure is largely different from it, and uh, so as the others. And uh, we can see it has a high risk of um, proposing uh, <clears throat> on synthesizable structures. The result, of course, varies according to different properties, but almost all of them are significantly worse than the virtual screening baseline. And of course, uh, we know this is not a thorough list of generative methods, but I think the current analysis of these algorithms can give some guidance on further development of generative methods. And uh, after knowing this, the current situation, um, the second question we want to solve is um, how to, you know, solve the problem. And so here we summarize the possible approaches to synthesizable molecular generations. And uh, here, like DDB is database, uh, synth uh, is uh, to see if it's synthesizable or not. Evaluator is the property uh, predictor. <coughs> and uh, A is basically just a virtual screening baseline. We start from a highly synthesizable database and uh, evaluate every candidate and then run them for uh, follow-up validation. B is the standard molecular generation process and that uh, focuses on the evaluation of uh, properties without regard for synthesizability. Uh, C, post hoc filter, uh, is we, something we always used for, uh, to narrow down the process. Uh, process candidate uh, as a separate step from generation. D uh, is the biasing by training set. Um, it aims to improve the synthesability by uh, training on uh, training a generative model on a highly synthesizable database to capture some prior about synthesizability. And E is a uh, bias by heuristic that use a uh, simple scalar proxies for sensibility as part of the objective function and to make the process uh, a multi-objective um, optimization. And F is an upgraded version. We directly use a CASP Oracle to run a full retrosynthetic and expansion for uh, proposed molecules to modify the reward function. So in a way of uh, multi-objective uh, optimization. G is an uh, explicit constraint uh, that's similar to the virtual screening. We attempt to, you know, first constrain the chemical space to search uh, is, uh, to be accessible with uh, viable building blocks and uh, well ca characterized uh, chemical reactions. And uh, of course, for the time reason, we only compare these approaches, and uh, we will talk about these two remaining later. The method we simulate these approaches are uh, forced for the post hoc filtering. Uh, of course, we know we just need to evaluate the non-biased generation, and we already we have already done it. 
from the bias by training set, uh, we train or start from uh, Campbell and uh, Moses to simulate the case to start from a higher synthesizable or a less synthesizable training set. And uh, for bias by heuristic, we multiply a wrapped uh, sensitivity proxy score uh, to the original objective function so that we can penalize the ones with high uh, synthetic uh, accessibility score. And uh, we only investigate uh, heuristic. Here is uh, SA score, SA score and the length of the smells. And we use a Gaussian on the sigmoid function to uh, wrap it. And uh, Here's the result of uh, generating unoptimized uh, molecules from different training sets. And we can uh, see pretty clearly um, they generate a similar fraction of synthesizable molecules to that of uh, training set. For MOSES, uh, which is about 89% uh, uh, synthesizable, this uh, generative methods uh, generate all about above uh, 80. Uh, it's surface, but it's almost 80. And uh, for Campbell, which is 60 something, they all uh, generate about 60 something uh, synthesizability. So um, I think we can say if the distribu distribution learning models is trained well, then it can uh, be successfully biased by using a more synthesizable data set. And that's what we call a priori biasing. Uh, when how? Yes. Sorry, if if you can go back to uh, the sure. previous slide. Mm -hmm. So, um, with with the data sets that that you're using, um, there's there's an imbalance in regards to the number of steps uh, required for for the creation of the molecule or the synthesis mm -hmm. of the molecule. Mm -hmm. um, majority, major, for majority of them, um, for the data sets, uh, you have uh, more of the the. Uh, compounds that uh, require less than five steps. Uh, so fewer uh, examples where, where you, uh, more steps are required. Is that going to affect uh, the results or uh, have you investigated that? Um, I think it will affect the result, but I haven't investigated that. Um, according to the current result, we can see the length of the bar for the same, uh, same uh, re uh, reaction steps, it's pretty similar uh, during uh, within the same training set. Um, like here, there, this is similar to the in which uh, the one step in Campbell. These are similar to the one step in Moses. So I think it will um, affect the uh, result. And uh, so it, it, let's say if we train only on uh, the ones that uh, requires fewer than five steps, then I think maybe most of the uh, result will uh, can be synthesized within five steps. But I haven't investigated that case of experiment. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and the, um, the optimized molecules and the heuristic bias. Uh, what we're showing here is the result of the, that start from the Campbell and the bias by SA score which is the best result. And in each plot, uh, the green solid line represents the uh, fraction of synthesizable compounds in top 100 suggestions. And red solid lines uh, represent the value of objective functions of the top one uh, synthesizable molecule. And the dash, uh, red dash line is the ones uh, that, uh, the, the, that value regardless of uh, its uh, synthesizability. And the left column is the uh, value, uh, the value of non-bias generation, and the right value is the uh, value of SA score bias generation. And uh, of course, it's a little complicated. And uh, what I want to show in this figure is just in most cases, the green solid line are upward sloping, which means we are improving the synthesizability. And the red, uh, especially the dashed lines, are kind of uh, tend to slope down, which means uh, we are reducing the uh, quantitative uh, performance of the uh, main objective function of the top one compound. And uh, we summarize the overall result in this table. And uh, we can first tell, what we can first tell is, um, you can see the difference between the ones using Campbell 
and the ones using Moses. It's not that obvious. And that's how we can, I think we can say the goal-directed generation methods are uh, less sensitive to the starting molecular set. And here, um, the trivial task uh, means uh, there are a lot of uh, high score structures and we can easily find one and the hard means the opposite. And uh, the higher uh, synthesizable fraction of the trivial task, I think also tells us um, if we don't need to like travel too far away from the initial set to find a high score structure, we can to some extent keep some prior uh, of the synthesizability. And so that's we have a higher uh, <coughs> fraction of synthesizable compounds. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, for the heuristic scores, um, uh, always kind of uh, improve the synthesizability. But uh, doing so also necessarily detracts from the main objective functions. Um, here, <coughs> here are some examples of molecules from uh, goal directed generations that were improved by uh, heuristic biasing. Uh, in these two cases, uh, no synthesizable compounds were found um, in the top 100 suggestions uh, without biasing, and, but at least one uh, was found, synthesizable compound was found uh, with either SA score or SC score biasing. Uh, although we can, we have a little bit uh, loss in the objective function, uh, at least we get rid of um, this monstrous, uh, you know, structures. Uh, and uh, these two cases, uh, in these two cases, we can find uh, at least one synthesizable uh, molecules without biasing, but the objective function uh, of uh, the the main objective function is improved uh, after we bias with a heuristic proxy score. And uh, that's may, uh, maybe due to we draw out some uh, uns unsensible space that uh, you know, make the exploration uh, more efficient and concentrate on the uh, synthesizable space. And uh, so it helps to use the tricks we mentioned earlier to relieve the problem temporarily. Uh, at least I don't think uh, they are the you know, long-term solution. So here uh, we discuss the two other approaches that we think would be uh, longer term, maybe the longer term solution. The first is the bias by Casper oracle. Of course, we know it's a upgraded version of heuristic biasing. Uh, it's more accurate, but the, it's too time consuming at this moment. Uh, the ask cost takes about uh, one minute per molecule to evaluate, and thus we need a more simple, efficient uh, goal-directed generation method for you to use that uh, approach. And the second one is the last one is the explicit constraint. Uh, <clears throat> like very similar to uh, what we did in virtual screening, we constrain the search, search space to be a uh, synthesizable chemical space. So that, um, uh, and some examples are uh, molecular chef, CAMBO, and PGFS. And uh, because <coughs> these are very, some very uh, recent work, so we didn't evaluate them. But uh, I think it's a good approach because you know it embeds the synthesizability inherently. And uh, conclusion, uh, ASCOS is a computer. The CASP tool uh, can provide a meaningful analysis of synthesizability, though it is uh, to some extent imperfect. Uh, distribu distribution learning algorithms uh, seem to generate molecules that are synthesizable. Uh, with similar frequency to the training set. And goal direct generation methods have a significant risk of proposing unsensible structures at their top suggestions. And uh, modifying the object function with SC score most always improves uh, sensibility, but at the expense of the main objective function value. And uh, current objective functions are still not good and not aligned with the real drug discovery cases. So some uh, more expensive uh, evaluation like docking should be you know, carried out. And uh, some outlook, first, of course, we need a more thorough investigation to include more uh, generative algorithms. 
and uh, we need a uh, quantification of uh, synthesizability for unsynthesizable ones. And uh, the last is biasing uh, generation with a full cast two, and uh, synthesizability embedded generation methods are two other potential approaches that are worth exploring. And one take home message take home message for all of my presentation today is the, um, it is meaningless to just design a molecule we cannot synthesize even they are you know scored high in some uh, scores and the code is to reproduce this work and data can be found in my uh, github repo and the, the web uh, website interface of ASCOS is released on this uh, website and this work is supported by uh, MLPDS consortium and we thank Mike and Thomas for assisting with uh, using ASCOS. And we thank uh, Jackie, uh, Lecky and uh, Claps for uh, commenting on the manuscript. Uh, here's my uh, email address. And uh, by the way, <laughs> Connor is looking for uh, postdocs. So if anybody is interested in uh, applying machine learning methods to tackle some real world chemical and biomedical problem, and uh, such as pharmaceutical discoveries, just please contact Connor. And thanks, that's all for my today. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, now I'm going to uh, allow the, the audience uh, to start uh, submitting their, their questions on uh, YouTube. Uh, during that time, I will start by asking you some questions myself. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's start with, um, the, the fact that the, the last thing that uh, you mentioned in your conclusion, and that is uh, um, objective function and mm -hmm. uh, synthesizability. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do you think in the future you're going to tackle this issue? Because uh, uh, they don't necessarily go uh, towards the, the same result. As you mentioned, by, by increasing synthesizability, your, your objective function uh, was affected. So how are you going to tackle this issue in the future? Oh, yes. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think the current, uh, like the uh, heuristic biasing is a long-term solution. And mm -hmm. uh, the most I appreciate is indeed the explicit constraint, like uh, the, this PGFS, which is the uh, I don't have the name. It's like kind of, I think it's policy gradient uh, for synthesizable chemical generation and something like that. And uh, they uh, instead of uh, item-wise uh, generation, they use reaction step-wise generation. Mm -hmm. So that in this case, they are and they are starting from uh, commercially available building blocks. So in this way, they embed the uh, sensibility into the generation process. So the uh, uh, so it's like the we carry out the forward uh, synthesis process, and the, the result is naturally synthesizable, or at least uh, to some extent, you know. So I think that's the like the most efficient maybe uh, approach, and uh, another is maybe we can if we have a better. Uh, evaluation for the synthesizability, then we can apply some, uh, use some multi-objective optimization, like uh, what we did in this work. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, could you please also go to slide uh, 23? 23, yes, this one. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Could you uh, explain about uh, the, the first molecule and uh, the reasons behind why uh, such a, a structure was generated um, in this process? Uh, okay, uh, you know, this molecule is uh, simply a monster. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, the reason I think this uh, generative algorithm generates molecules like this is because uh, under current setting, we still take it as a valid compound. And uh, the current um, uh, whatever smell-based or uh, uh, graph-based uh, generative method, the constraint they are using is the validity. And uh, by validity, we mean is the, we keep the valency correct for each element. And like in this case, this, um, uh, 
every you know this structure is terrible, but uh, every like uh, n have a uh, link to three atoms, and this i link to five atoms, and baron link to three atoms. So the balance is correct. So I think the problem for the like the fundamental problem for the current uh, generative method is the uh, search space we are defining as the valid chemical space, but not the synthesizable chemical space. And that there's a gap between these two. So like uh, the GDB is a database that enumerating all the valid space, and uh, we see there's only about 3% uh, synthesizable fraction. And so I think that's the reason. Okay. What we need is yeah, the synthesizable compounds, not, on, not only valid compounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had we had a question from the audience, and they're asking if you can explain again the significance of the SA score. Significance of the SA score. Um, I'm not sure. Significance. I, of I believe they're asking why, in case of the SA score, um, that that it works better than the 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 other. Oh uh, oh oh. Um, I think. Uh, Maybe, you know, we can, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I think we can see this figure. Uh, this is the, you know, SA score is based on the structure complexity. And the SA score uh, is kind of based simply, uh, you know, distinguish which one is more likely to be reactant or a product. And, uh, you know, length of smiles is more uh, meaningless. And uh, this is, uh, uh, I'll say, AUC curve that uh, we use the result of ASCOS as the ground truth and try to use the, uh, the heuristic proxy scores as the only feature to distinguish the synthesizable and unsynthesizable ones. And we can see SA score is the best. And I think to some extent, um, it is true that uh, the molecules uh, with a more complex structure is harder to synthesize. Uh, but so that's, I think that's the reason uh, the in current uh, experiment, uh, SA score works the best among the three, but that's not always the true. And uh, we can see uh, none of the three can you know, perfectly distinguish uh, the synthesizable ones and unsynthesizable ones. And uh, this is the uh, graph for SA score. And we can see around five, there's a small hill. And I think that uh, can be explained by, there are some, uh, uh, this, this uh, plot means the fraction of synthesizable uh, compounds uh, in the range of uh, SA score. And I think this hill means um, there are some uh, molecules that are very complex, especially very similar to the ones we can directly buy from the market that we don't have to, you know, although it's very complex, we don't have to apply, uh, you know, carry out too much uh, uh, experiment to reach that structure. So they are uh, synthesizable, but uh, also in the same time, it's a uh, structure complex. So, it is working pretty good now, but uh, it's not enough, of course. Uh, could you go back to the AUC plot that uh, you yeah, showed? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, um, in, in regards to, to this uh, plot, um, could you explain the details of the experiment that you're, uh, you're doing? Uh, is this a class? Because I think in the paper you mentioned that this is a, a classification task that you're performing. Can, can you explain the, what it is that uh, you did here? Yeah, um, I, what I did here is just uh, simply take the result of ASCOS as a ground truth and uh, use the pro proxy score as a single feature and try to train, uh, try to see if we can distinguish the synthesizable and unsynthesizable ones. And okay. uh, yeah, that is the experiment I did. Okay. Uh, can you also go to slide 21? One. This one. Ah. Okay. So, um, when you were performing these tasks, um, did you uh, test uh, the effect of the the type of uh, 
um, compounds or whether or not having uh, more steps would, would affect these or the type of uh, molecules that uh, you feed into the model, would, would those affect the results or that's not the case? Uh, type of the, uh, you mean uh, the, the, like the starting pool or training set we are using? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, I think this result is shown here. Uh, okay. The Campbell with the uh, two cases we start from Campbell doesn't have a, you know, uh, don't have a, like a significant difference from the one we start from Moses. Okay. So we think it's less sensitive to the starting molecular set. And I think part of the reason is, uh, you know, to figure out the high score structure, we are travel away from the initial uh, data set. Okay. Um, and uh, another question about slide 21. Um, do you have an idea of, of uh, the difficulty of these tasks uh, in comparison to each other? Uh, well, in compared to each other, um, this uh, order is to some kind, to some extent is the from the easiest to the hardest. Okay. So we can see um, this side, uh, this line seems like a uh, very flat because mm -hmm. it's kind of a uh, easier task, more trivial. So they don't, you know, uh, they have some a little bit uh, improvement, but not too much. And uh, synthesizability, uh, the fraction of the synthesizable compounds is also pretty high at the beginning without biasing. But for the hardest one, we can see the, you know, the result is terrible. Even um, in some cases, even we cannot find even one uh, synthesizable structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, it's also the improvement is also significant compared to the okay. trivial ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting because the more difficult the task gets, uh, the the uh, bias with essay score increases. That's very interesting. Um, okay, so what else? Uh, uh, can you also go to slide eighteen? Uh, this is a question from the audience, uh -huh. and they're asking what is the difference between B and C. Ah, oh, B and C. Uh, B is the standard molecular generation. And uh, in this case, we are not talking about to filter out uh, the unsensible uh, chemical structures. And C is we add a filter to filter out the you know, structure with uh, you know, alerts, or in our case, it's the unsensible ones uh, according to the ASCOS. OK. Um, final question, uh, slide 14. And I I think this one is unrelated to your work. It's related to the work from, I think, pre, pre uh, the uh, slide before this. I think the work done by Silico, uh, in Silico. Oh, in Silico, uh, this one? I think, pre yes, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, do you remember uh, what method they used to, to select the six molecules? Uh, oh. The forty molecules. Uh, well, they. I think they are simply select the six from this forty uh, manually. Oh, okay. But, but okay. I'm not very sure. But I think it is. And uh, they first generate about thirty thousand, and mm -hmm. maybe use some uh, computational model to filter to forty. And I think this forty, I think they select manually. Okay. But Great. I'm not sure about that. Of course. <laughs> That's fine. Um, <laughs> Let me just double check if there are any questions mm -hmm. um, online. They're asking uh, about the feedback provided to the generator in case of B. Uh, oh. You, uh, that, you know how uh, we talked about the different- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. This one, right? <clears throat> um, Cause you know, uh, uh, you know, to include uh, the both the uh, distribution learning case and the go-directed generation case, uh, we kind of like, uh, you know, we can apply some kind of uh, optimization methods like reinforcement learning or uh, Bayesian optimization to guide the, uh, to, or the biased uh, generation process toward a higher value uh, structure. 
And that's what I want to mean by this arrow. OK. Um, I think that answered the question. So with that, I would like to thank you. It has a pleasure having you on our platform. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I would like to thank the audience uh, for joining us today. And with that, uh, I would like to say goodbye to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.